Welcome to Tomorrow. We are Carrie Ann and Jamie Higginbotham. We will be your hosts for this show. This week we had a really fun, live, interactive conversation with you, the fellow space nerds. We start off by talking about Dragon One, its final mission. Memories. Exactly, the memories of Dragon One. We then moved on to Boeing and what in the world is happening over there? And then somehow that kind of led us into the, the space launch system. Yeah. Like that was just organically sort of happened. People were like, also this. So if you're a space nerd and you're interested in all of the space geekery, stay tuned, because tomorrow begins right now. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? So Zach actually gets us into one of the topics that we wanted to talk about today, um, and that is thoughts on the last flight of Dragon One, right? Yeah. Because uh, this has a special place near and dear to us, because yeah. we both work, we always say Company X, but every, you know, we work at SpaceX, which means we're not allowed to talk about SpaceX, yeah. right? So we don't represent the views and opinions of SpaceX, we are not official spokespeople for SpaceX. Like, so we just choose not Nor to Nor would we want to be. No, yeah, we really don't Let's want be to be. Fair. So we choose not to talk about SpaceX and we bring other people on board. So we yeah, can't really, yeah, yeah. we can't talk about any of like the non, like the, the technical specific stuff yeah. to this or anything, yeah. anything truly SpaceX related. But because this is around the time frame, Dragon One spinning up is around the time frame both of us came online. We yeah. have like personal and unique views of Dragon One that I think are a little bit maybe different. And I just want like, this was, for those who don't know, CRS-20, which just flew to the International Space Station mm -hmm. about, what, what has it been, 48 hours ago? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's birthing with the space station so, soon. Um, yeah, I won't get into that. Uh, or already has, I, I've, I've lost track of No, time. I thought it was the ninth, and today's the eighth. Okay, so um, last Dragon 1. It's an end of an th era. This is it, yeah, it's so the end like, of an era. It's also, so it's the end of the contract. It was CRS-20, was the last one. It just happens to also be the last of the Dragon Ones. Um, we're moving on to human rated and, and cargo rated Dragon. So Dragon 2, V2, Mark 2, whatever it is you want to call it, because apparently it's been called everything in the universe right now. Um, and this is the one that can carry not just humans, but as well as cargo in, in a lot of different configurations. And I came up with a fantastic analogy. Yeah. Because we are, my department is currently hiring, so I've been doing a lot of these interviews. And uh, this young lady that I was trying to explain this to, a, I'd never watched Doctor Who before, so when I was, what I know, so when I was joking, that's a little bit like the TARDIS because you can actually fit seven humans in there. She gave me a blank stare, and <laughs> I was like, okay. Uh, but then I was trying to explain like it can do humans and cargo, and she also still kind of gave like a blank <laughs> stare to me. She, we didn't hire this girl. It doesn't matter. <laughs> the point is, the point is here though that uh, I said that this dragon is a lot like a minivan. Right, so sometimes you need to go to the grocery store and it's you and one other person, but you gotta get a lot of groceries. And then there's other times when you're going like family road trip and there's like five people and then like three suitcases. But like either way, you can reconfigure the minivan however you need to. And there's sometimes you're taking a longer trip and you've got five people and you've got five suitcases, but you only have room for three suitcases inside, but you'd put two more on the roof. And that's like our un what? This is brilliant. It's right. I was so. I love this so much. I have not <laughs> actually heard this until now. So she is. Cur you are watching her <laughs> break my brain. Keep going. But I mean, because that was the unpressurized cargo section. Because we were trying to explain that. Yeah. Because like you got the because you got the pressurized part where the people have to go. And there's some stuff where you would want to have like the fruit and vegetables and stuff like those have to be inside. But then so <laughs> this is so much better <laughs> than any way I have ever explained. I, I was. Tar <laughs> you Tardis is from me, right? Because yeah, I explained no, Dragon absolutely. like a Tardis. I'm like, but the it, thing is, a lot of people, small, yeah. right? And a lot of people just don't. Even if you have seen Doctor Who, it's still difficult. You look at Dragon and you're like, there's no way humans can fit in there. There's just there just isn't. And you're like, but. You start explaining it that it is though Dragon Drink, Two is space, space minivan. minivan. <laughs> you start explaining it that way, and it, it becomes a lot simpler. You're like, oh right, you take a couple seats out, you can get more cargo in. Sometimes the you know you have the beef jerky and the sodas on the inside, but you can put the clothes on the outside, and yep. those those can be unpressurized. It's not a big deal. And uh, yeah, thankfully she got it then. So questions like this: Can Dragon Two have more than four seats now? Though yeah. this is where we have to kind of like 
Like any technical questions like this, we're gonna have to just skip. Right. Um, like we can bring on other people who can answer these for you, but they can't be us. Right. But first off, that's brilliant. Also, I just want to point out you're hiring. So if anyone wants to, this, <laughs> is, this is the cool thing about space is everyone thinks yeah. you need to be like a, an engineer or yeah. a rocket scientist. Yeah. And that is very untrue. You're hiring baristas, right? Yeah, I'm hiring baristas right now uh, as well as dining room attendants. Uh, so, I mean, if you are in remote, anywhere close to being food service industry, like there's a whole entire department inside of SpaceX that is hiring. And you're um, hiring countrywide, I think, right? Uh, so, yeah, or at least, at least California, Texas, Texas Florida? Uh, yeah, I think maybe also Seattle. I'm not positive. So basically, if you live in the United States and you want to work for SpaceX, check out their jobs posting page mm -hmm. because it's so, aerospace is so much more than just en just the engineering of the rocket. Oh, absolutely. It's everything because I can't function without my coffee. Right. I bet, <laughs> I bet a lot of people at SpaceX would say the same thing. For sure. And so you would be helping to do that. So for sure. I, I would just recommend going to their careers page. What is it? SpaceX.com slash careers? Careers. Yep. Easy as, um, easy as that. Um, in any case, so like, so there's there's those sorts of things. Um, so that's that's a major, major differentiator between Dragon 1 and Dragon 2. But yeah, we both came on right around uh, the very beginning of the COTS program and uh, uh, CRS missions and what have you. Um, it was one of the first missions that I got to see inside uh, Dragon? Yeah. A spaceship? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my, I have that funny story in Dragon 2 too. Yeah. So COTS, for those who don't know, that was the contract that um, SpaceX won along with um, um, North, not North Grumman, um, or Orbital, oh man, who was it at the time? It was uh, Orbital. I think it was Orbital it was at Orbital, the time. Yeah. Um, to fly payload. It was the Commercial Orbital Transportation Services contract, Services I think, is, contract? I think yeah. that's what it was. Yeah. Um, and that was a contract to send to basically become the FedEx of space, right? You send your payload up to the International Space Station. SpaceX won that. I got hired just after uh, Falcon 9 Flight 1. Mm -hmm. So this is nearly nine years ago. Yeah. So I was there for Falcon 9 Flight 2. Mm -hmm. Never Falcon 1, Falcon yep. 9, which was the COTS 2 Plus contract. And mm -hmm. that's where they took, there were supposed to be three COTS missions. Yep. Um, and then once that part was done, that would then they would consider it like operational and they moved to CRS, which is the Commercial Resupply Services. Orbital so, Sciences, then Orbital ATK, and now part of Northrop Grumman. And now, yeah, Northrop Grumman. And so this is why we can't remember what orbital, it was called at the orbital, time. Orbital Sciences ATK, a Space Innovations Division of Northrop Grumman. There you go. <laughs> I think is what we, is, uh, is, yeah. what we jokingly call them. Uh, yeah, so... Um, I've been there since COTS 2 Plus, and COTS 2 Plus was the combination of COTS 2 and COTS 3, so two different missions that they kind of moved together so that they could kind of push the program along. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I remember sitting there and working on that basically full time. All I mm -hmm. did at that time, we were so laser focused on COTS 2 Plus. At like 12, 16, you remember when I first started? It yeah. was crazy it was long crazy, days. Crazy. Um, and it was just constantly working on Dragon and, and just like this incredible machine um, that no one had really ever done before. It had always been like the purview of giant governments. Mm, so mm -hmm. there wasn't a huge, great bl blueprint for something like this. Um, did they change it again? <laughs> now it's the Northrop Grumman space sector? Or is it? I mean, it's anyhow? a lot easier to say, let's be fair. It's a lot easier to say. That's funny though. Anyhow. Um, and then I remember, I remember the pucker factor of Falcon 9 Flight 2. Yeah. And like, um, see, like we, at least in my, my role, I'm the, I'm, I'm now, I'm now pr uh, principal video systems engineer. So, um, I was responsible for making sure that all of the, the video worked everywhere, including from the pad to the consoles and from just everywhere. Um, uh, and the webcast. And I was just, I was so so worried that time came to a halt on that first launch on COTS 2 Plus. Mm. And I remember like liftoff through Dragon Separation was about a four hour event. <laughs> 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 and then once Dragon separated, um, I was like, I was able to breathe a sigh of relief, but now I'm worried about the space to ground right, video lifts right. and how they're gonna perform. And they did pretty decent. Um, and then I think it, I didn't actually like re relax mm -hmm. until we were attached to the space station. Yeah, I bet. Um, and I think the entire company was like that at that moment, just kind of like this tense moment of like, 
Oh, companies you know, really young. What don't you know? Yeah. What you know? What don't we know? Yeah. What, what, what yeah, didn't yeah. we think about? What did we forget? Just like that kind of paranoid, like how can we do this better? What what didn't we do? And it, it went off without a hitch. And so that is my introduction. My introduction into working at an aerospace company is Dragon One. Mm -hmm. So for me, getting rid of Dragon One is a little bit bittersweet. Yeah. Because I love Dragon Two as well, or Crew Dragon, yeah. or whatever we're, whatever we're calling it. Um, I banged my head on it many times. <laughs> like, I know, boohoo. That's what I said too. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I literally, I, <laughs> I think I bled in Dragon Two, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <man>. accidentally. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, it's I'm going to miss Dragon One. Mm -hmm. It was really cool, and those missions were always something special. Uh, just something a little bit more than um, the satellite missions. Not mm -hmm. that the satellite missions aren't important, but there was something just a little more magical about the Dragon mm -hmm. missions. The thing that I'm really excited for, though, with Dragon 2, I think it's going to take that magic up a notch, yeah. right? Because it's, it's the vehicle that we can send humans on. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be pretty cool. I appreciate the uh, that this last CRS-20 mission is uh, a refurbished dragon. Mm -hmm. uh, she's got her little stamp of approval, so her couple different ISS uh, tattoos yep. on her, which I think is kind of cool. Um, but yeah, I think it'll be interesting to kind of see, kind of like uh, people put on football helmets uh, the number of like, I don't know, it's a sports thing, so I guess I don't really know. But I, I just know that, you know, you, you mark how many times you've been somewhere, what have you. Um, almost like a passport stamp, I guess it's more like that. Uh, so it'll be kind of neat to see the first uh, Crew Dragon with her all of her different ISS stamps on it. I think that that'll will be, be cool. That'll be, that'll really, be really cool. They might have to make them smaller because they're they're quite large right now. Like they're really about this big. Would they change the stamp based on whether it sent crew up or cargo? Ooh, maybe we could change the color. Mm, that's a good idea. That's right. Um, Smoke Scale wants to know: Can you buy a non-flight capable Dragon One capsule as like a backyard shed for uh, or fort for kids? Asking for a friend. Um, that, well, wouldn't that be incredible? It would be, but the number of times that just Jamie has hit her head on one, I'm not sure that you want only two. Never your on kids one. tumbling around in one. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. To be fair, that was an unfinished Dragon Two. Yeah, right? yeah, that was yeah, the yeah. that was the mock-up that we had for the the release, the unveiling of Crew sure. Dragon. Yeah, and uh, it was like very early stages and I had to get in and like wire up my infrastructure and there was like there was literally nothing in there there was it was an empty shell and so you have to kind of like I, I don't know how to describe this but you've got the the door opening and you have to like reach in and grab a handle kind of up and then like pull yourself through the door and mm -hmm. swing in and like jump down because again the floor is not complete either so you you have a little bit of a fall in there and if you miss you go BAM on the back of the head and you know, it hurts. And I remember, um, so this is Dragon 2 now, not Dragon 1. I remember uh, we haven't even released Dragon 2 to the public. No one knows we're working on it really. Mm -hmm. um, no one has seen this mm -hmm. thing. It's a fairly secret project, even inside of SpaceX. Let me quasi secret. You, got, you still have engineers working on it, but yeah. like, you know, uh, only a handful of people that are actually like, looking at it, let alone going inside of it. And I'm going in and out constantly. Mm -hmm. And I come home to Carrie Ann. Ooh, I know. I know, I, I, know, I, know. I come home to I Carrie Ann and I'm like, oh, my head is pounding. I had to go in the spaceship today. And like, uh, I, had to, I had to work inside of Dragon all day. She's and like, can you move my shoulders? Like, they kind of hurt. I was in and out of the spaceship all day. And I was like, no, why would I want to do that? Like, how dare you? Boo -hoo. Are you serious? Like, seriously, boo-hoo. Do you hear yourself right now as in and out of a spaceship all day? Ooh, I don't, like, that's like, not how I meant it. But, yeah. <laughs> I just, I can't sometimes, you guys. Yep. Like, so, this is anyhow. Kind of thing. Um, yeah, don't have that problem on the new drag. Like, now they actually have walkways into it, and it's much, much easier. And you don't yeah. have to, Like, there's a floor, right? So, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, anyhow, you. You're, oh, someone had asked what you do... Um, I'm the barista supervisor. I saw the question. I'm a barista supervisor. Um, I wish I could bring it up on screen, but yes. Yeah. So, um, based on, for those who don't know the SpaceX layout, um, the main coffee bar, oh, there you go, thank you. Mm -hmm. The main coffee bar for SpaceX is literally right in front of Mission Control. Mm -hmm. And hanging in front of Mission Control is the very first dragon hot one, one dragon. <laughs> so zero, zero, one. you are literally looking at serial zero, zero, 001, the mm -hmm. very first spaceship that SpaceX day, ever day. sent to orbit 
all day air day. Mm -hmm. What are your what's your memories and thoughts? Well, first of all, she's well. dirty. She needs to be dusted. She doesn't need to be dusted. Uh, they just dusted the leg, thankfully, and I didn't realize how dirty that was. And it's a rocket factory. Like it, they, they kick up dirt. Yeah. Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. uh, that's funny. Um, yeah. No. Uh, yeah. The, my very first experience of being able to watch a launch from inside the building, because everything else has been like how everybody else sees it, right? You watch it on YouTube, um, or you watch it on Space Vacast. Um, was really, it, it was, it was really nerve wracking. It was the, the feeling around it was just so different. It reminded me a lot of watching space shuttle launches. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've had the fortunate opportunity to be able to go down to the media site and uh, broadcast spa the last few space shuttle launches from there. Um, and that was really amazing. And um, so it was it was interesting though because right when I first started, uh, the food services department didn't really exist. Mm -hmm. like, oh yes, that's true. We were barely just there was sort no of- kitchen. Yeah, we were barely spinning up at the time. And so everyone who worked there were, were food service workers but I was like the only person who was like a space nerd too, or at least like knew a little bit about what was going on. And once they started to understand that I understood what was happening, then they just started asking me a lot of questions. Mm. And a lot of questions I, I, I didn't know, I couldn't answer. I was like, well, I mean, I don't, obviously I don't work on it. So like, what's happening now? Like, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, for a while, it has to do stuff for a while. And then, and then the, the solar panels come out. Like I, I was, is that solar panels? Is yeah, solar, this is solar panels. So for all, that's, this is solar panels. That's what they do. Yeah, they, well, they, they kind of, they do actually, they're actually. Kind of more like yeah, one at a time. Yeah, um, but you know, I was getting a lot of questions like that, and so I, I firmly established myself as being the uh, the space nerd. I think nerd in my department in a space company. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but I mean in my department because because a lot of people just hadn't they just didn't they didn't know they didn't know. It's great though because then you can kind of see people now, uh, like they they know a lot more now, which is really kind of cool. It's it's been nice to see that that growth, but it was, yeah, it was really exciting. Thoughts really, on Dragon really One, like, not anymore? Um, you know, I think it's time to a certain extent. Like, it's kind of sad that we didn't get to refurbish this one more times and use it for more things, right? She's only been to station two, twice, this will be our third time. Um, but that's kind of cool that we could we could do that, that that was like even a thing. Um, this, Smoke yeah, scale. I did this too early. I'm sorry. Like it's, I, it's I meant totally to hit fine. blue and it's I hit totally, red. Actually. No, I know. But yeah, we're a little scale, rusty. What is the most po popular coffee drink at service at SpaceX? Um, so. Oh yeah, you go through like your brewed coffee. Yeah, we go we go through about 300 gallons of drip coffee a day uh, at, at one location. Uh, we have multiple locations there. It's hard to say. Uh, our menu is kept very small for for a lot of different reasons. Um, I only have seven things items on my menu, so. Um, lattes, cappuccinos, americanos, and mochas are probably all tied. I just named four out of seven items on my menu, right? So like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe it's eight items on my menu now that I think about it. In any case, it doesn't matter. Like we, we just, we have a really, really small menu. So instead of walking into a Starbucks or a Pete's Coffee or a Caribou or, you know, your favorite coffee shop and have like three pages worth of items, we have like six or seven items. Um, yeah, so they're, they're all pretty popular and we only have three, six flavors. So there's only so many combinations you can make of anything mm -hmm. anyway. So. I have a fun game I play now, which is when I go down to get a drink from Carrie Ann, mm -hmm. um, I, I play the I'll have what they're having game. Yep. And so whatever Sometimes the last it drink, it's it, great. it backfired last time severely. It's whatever fantastic. the last drink that she made for the last person that was mm -hmm. right before me, that's the drink I get. Because the thing is, like, we also have a bunch of different uh, milks as well. So, uh, and that's that's really what killed you on that one was mm -hmm. the milk. Uh, the, um, Don D asks, uh, Jamie, what do you do there? I'm the principal video systems engineer, so I don't edit any video. Hmm. Uh, my primary role is taking uh, photons, converting them to electrons, and moving them around the planet. And uh, so that's what I do. So when you're watching the live webcast, I'm not necessarily creating the content of the webcast, but the fact that you can see the webcast and you mm -hmm. can see those pad cameras, um, the ability for us to paint and shade those cameras um, in the webcast control room, 
Um, that's all me. So I'm moving video around. Um, I'm, I'm working on making sure all of that works so that you can watch things. And then, you know, also, that, I mean, I would say the webcast is maybe 5 to 10% of what I do, and mm -hmm. then the rest of it is just, you know, all the other video that uh, goes into a major aerospace company, and there is a lot. Um, uh, whoops, I missed. Uh, I missed again. Uh, Catherine <laughs> says, I'm seriously about to move out of, Al I believe that's Albuquerque, and go sling coffee at Company X. You should. Like, if this is something you're passionate about, again, I can't stress it. And also, it's not Company X. Did you see recently Long Beach, every aerospace company and their friends seem is to be Long within Beach like radio? a one mile radius is fantastic. in Long Beach? And I was talking to Lisa the other day. I think we both were. I don't, mm -hmm. uh, and they've got like this really cool hangar bar thing mm -hmm. going on over mm -hmm. there where it's just like, a bunch of different restaurants in a, in a hangar that has a lot of history. Mm -hmm. um, was it a Grumman? No, it was a, um, not a Hughes hangar. Um, anyhow, um, it's just like, if it's not just SpaceX. You've got Virgin Galactic, Virgin Orbit. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, just Virgin Orbit. Virgin over Orbit, there. Rocket Labs Rocket down there. Um, Blue just opened up yep. uh, an area. I don't know if they're in Long Beach, but Blue just opened up an office that's in LA. Um, SpaceX, of course, is in LA. It was, it was, it's a Douglas. Hang there you go, you Douglas. Sure. Thank you, Tim. Um, yeah, yep. there's, there's just a lot of aerospace in LA, just generally speaking, and they all have different needs. Um, I know that uh, a couple of the bigger companies have coffee and food services and what have you. Like, yeah, if that's like something that you guys want to do, there's definitely plenty of openings all over. And you want to work at a space company, that's definitely an option. A human person asks, so is Jamie the person to be mad at when we don't get to see the drone ship landing? To be blunt, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, it, at the end of the day, it is a team effort. And uh, I believe we've basically fixed that problem now, hmm. um, for the most part. And again, it was a, uh, I'm not going to take credit for fixing it, because the final solution that got that working wasn't me. But um, yeah, there, it like, I worked on that for years, and we tried, you have no idea, and I can't really talk to it, but we tried basically every launch for, I think it's been four or five years, I, I've forgotten the time frame. Mm -hmm. Since we've started landing, I have been trying to solve that, and we tried something new every single landing to mm -hmm. get that to work. And um, yeah, and I, I, I cannot tell you what uh, allowed us to fix it. I can't really even talk about uh, what causes the problem. It is way more complicated than uh, you probably think it is. No, a buoy won't help. No, you can't do ship to ship. Um, so, uh, <laughs> you know, that's all I'll say. Mm, uh, that's funny. In uh, case. Yep. Uh, yeah. yeah, we got off topic with the uh, coffee little bit, and whatnot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, did we have other topics on Dragon One or on? Uh, no, I think we're good there. It was a there. good transition point because mm -hmm. I wanted to. The other thing I wanted to talk about today is. Um, um, actually, this is a good one. Uh, Alamer, any suggestions for where a lifelong space geek who's pivoting from tech support and going back to college for software engineering ought to look to relocate? Well, I mean, if it's software engineering, I feel like Silicon Valley is probably still... Silicon Valley, uh, kind of the Seattle area has got a bunch of stuff, and actually Austin, Texas is another surprising yes. area. Yes. Mm -hmm. If the, I would say those three. And Austin's great. And I think that was. Not that there's anything wrong with Seattle or Silicon Valley necessarily, but I think it's. I think you're right. I think it's a a, a much overlooked city for that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, and actually, th this is what I was just about to get into: mm -hmm. Boeing and their failures. Uh, another good topic to talk talk about. And you know, I don't. I've always taken kind of an optimistic view mm -hmm. of everything, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like. B b we are in this together as humanity, so it's not pro SpaceX, pro Boeing, or anti SpaceX. Like, wh why do we have to be pro or con a certain company? Why right. can't we be pro humanity? Yep. And if we're pro humanity, then we're also pro Boeing, mm -hmm. and we're pro SpaceX, we're pro Northrop, we're pro all of them. Mm -hmm. We want everyone to succeed because we're not doing enough in space right now. But yes. like, also saying that, oh no, Boeing's doing great would be disingenuous. Sure. They are not doing great. Well, as a company, they will survive. Oh, absolutely. But like, it feels like they've got major engineering issues. And I have been thinking about this a lot because we know some engineers at Boeing. Mm -hmm. They're scary smart people. Oh yeah. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. ridiculously smart. So uh, yeah, and actually, uh, ah, uh, being pro space doesn't mean you shouldn't be pointed at things that go wrong. Exactly, exactly. And so I've been really thinking about Boeing 
-hmm. And like, what happened here? Because it's not just aerospace. I, well, I mean, it is aerospace, like the Boeing 737 MAX. Right, right, right. Um, you know, they had issues with their uh, Starliner, and then they had issues with communications on their Starliner, like literally communicating to us what was going on. There was a lack of transparency, and now they're trying to be too transparent, and like, yeah. it's it's like they're just, they're, they have just lost their way, and it's like, what what happened? Because I don't believe it to be an inch in actual engineering issue. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think Loopy got. I think Loop, Loopy got to where I kind of was going, which is: is it an operational culture thing more than an intelligence thing, like the shuttle program in 1986 and uh, OT three? I think that's it. I think specifically, it might be a management issue. Hmm. So this is all personal opinion at this point, right? And I would love your comment and feedback below. And if you're watching live, like, like let, let's work through some of this stuff because mm -hmm. we know some of the engineers are scary smart. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, obviously some of the issues are engineering issues, but what seems to have changed is a management shift from building really great engineering components or really great engineering designs from, we'll call that probably 10 to 20 years ago, is okay. when that, that Boeing of 20 years ago okay. versus the Boeing of today, it feels like it's more centered on shareholder profit and making mm. sure that the people who have stocks get a return on their investment. Sure. And so that means minimizing costs, cutting everywhere where possible, not necessarily caring about the engineering, but caring about the bottom line. Oh, that's interesting, because I actually went a slightly different oh, way. Oh, where did you go? Well, I was wondering if they started to get, like, just literally too big, right? I think there are some times that you hear about some companies that you, you're trying to retain the best talent all the way around, and so then you hire, for instance, three people to do the job of one person, and then you start like dividing out the one person's job amongst three people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to the point where you're just, you're so big, you're so bloated, you're so gigantic that like just trying to make decisions on even simple things, mm -hmm. you have to get the okay from like six different people and they all have to agree mm -hmm. in order to move forward that like things have just gotten to this like weird glacial pace that you just are unable to move at all. You just you're not dynamic. You're not flexible because you have too many too many cooks in the kitchen. Effectively, see what I'm saying? Yeah, that could be it too. I I mean I hadn't actually taken that approach either. And I'm I mean I was gonna say I mean I like you. It's an interesting theory. It's it's not, it's not something I had even thought of before. Uh, and then so you, you're saying too big. And then uh, I'm wondering if kind of spinning off of that a little bit, it's um, complacency, mm -hmm. right? So when you have years and years of success, which to be blunt, let, let's remember, Boeing has had decades of success. Oh, absolutely. Right? Their failures That's are how they a got fairly to where they recent are. issue. Yeah. Yes. They've had failures too. Like let's sure, not pretend sure, like there sure. were no issues in the past, but yeah. like, the major, major failures of recent are fairly recent. Mm -hmm. So maybe they just got complacent. And, and it's not just uh, uh, Boeing that got complacent. Um, uh, it's also in part NASA's fault on oversight. They admitted it in a recent uh, conference. It's not just something mere space men say, it's something that NASA themselves say. Yeah, it could be one right. of those things of like, look, they've been doing well for so long, like we're friends, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure you'll get it, no big deal, this, that, and the other, like we don't know about that new guy, but fine. Like, I'm sure you'll figure it out. I'm not gonna worry about it because you always do. That could be oversight. Um, yeah, I, I just, it just makes me wonder. Um, the chat room is really big on McDonnell Douglas merger and saying mm. it was the, actually the McDonnell Douglas management coming in that broke Boeing, which could be true too. Interesting. Um, yeah. So I think it's easy for folks to think engineering issue. And, and actually, I think that's fundamentally my point. Anytime you have a complicated thing like a spacecraft like this, you're always going to be able to point to the engineers and say, you failed. Mm -hmm. But you, you need to take a step back because engineering isn't just one person building a part. Oh, for sure. It's a whole lot of decisions and compromises and like um, a game of kind of tug, and, uh, tug of war and with the rest of the vehicle and the rest of the teams, which right. is maintained not by the engineer, but those wars are fought by management. Yes. And so it's actually the decisions of management that ultimately create a lot of these problems, which is why that's where I went. Well, and that's why you need the transparency inside of the company. They all need to be communicating with each other and you all need to be um, transparent about like what your timelines are and like how long do you think that's gonna take and you can't go, oh, that's gonna take me two days when it's really gonna take six weeks. Like that doesn't make any sense in any way, shape or form, right? And so then the next team is going to, oh, well, they're doing that and 
in two days and like I need to get my stuff done in a single day and like you know timelines on that are very specific and then yeah that's when you do start to cut corners because like well I mean my manager promised this in two days and he normally this would take six weeks and 20 of us but now there's only going to be three of us working on it like there's there could be a bazillion different reasons a bazillion different ways that this could be getting out of hand, just generally speaking. Uh, Bri Byron uh, mentioned they wanted the McDonnell Douglas government contracts and ended up with the McDonnell Douglas profit drive that mm. caused McDonnell Douglas to fail in the first place. And, and I think that's really important. And actually someone, uh, it was Jens right after that, said that's why I like Elon's take on engineering issues. Email me. And I tend to agree, like, the way that the new space, it's not just SpaceX, Again, it's but just like, transparency about all of it, right? Like, you have to, like, if one group is gonna say, hey, this is actually gonna take us six weeks to do, they, everyone else has to go, okay, it's gonna take you six weeks to do, and you need to like back up for a minute. Now, it shouldn't probably always take you six weeks, see if you can whittle that down to four maybe, but like either way, like you have to have that transparency with, within the company all the way around. And it, yeah, that's why I was like, if you have too many people working on the exact same project, like that could really mess you up hard. Uh, how would you pronounce that? If, if Avielo? Avielo? Uh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your username very badly. Um, saying that um, Boeing's going to have a very hard time to adapt to fast iterative design. I think a lot of the old space companies are going to have that issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, and that isn't to say that fast iterative design is always a win either. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. So. There are pros and cons to all of these different yeah, You need approaches. to take time in order to go over. You can't be going too fast, because if you're going too fast, you're going to miss something. At the same time, you have 30 people looking at the exact same thing, and you must make sure that they all agree on the exact same thing. That's also going to take you way too much time. Like, there has to be some compromise somewhere in the middle, for sure. Uh, Mike brings up a good point. Engineering is all about compromising to make uh, every part just good enough to do the job, which is very true. But uh, the thing that people forget is that there's that layer above the engineers of management mm -hmm. that also dictates certain requirements that can have a negative impact yes. on those parts. Yes. That the engineers oftentimes will say, engineering will come back and be like, no. <laughs> and management will go, yeah, you're doing it anyhow. And, and it's, it's th that mentality yeah, that, that can, can bad. break stuff. And I, yeah. I, I do not know if this is what, this is all pure speculation, but. You look at Boeing of 20 years ago, what a proud and amazing company. Mm -hmm. Like, it would be a place where, you, as an engineer, you would want to go to work. Oh, it'd for be, sure. It, be, it was the top of the pyramid. Yeah. And you look at Boeing today, not as much. Yeah, I, I forget who it was, but somebody much earlier said something like, could it just be that all the good engineers are going to Blue Origin and SpaceX? I mean, I guess that's an option. I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, great question from Kenneth. Would the management bloat also be the cause of the slowdown on the space launch system? Hmm. Um, again, I think that's just them trying to potentially maximize profits. And I think it's partly NASA's problem, too. NASA has a oh. tendency to want perfection uh, up front and like all of the paperwork that goes with perfection. Mm -hmm. I think another entity that will struggle with iterative uh, rapid design mm -hmm. um, is NASA. Like, that is just mm -hmm. not how they think. That's not how they work. Right. To them, failure is not an option. You right. cannot fail. Right. And as soon as failure is not an option, your program is going to take forever and it's going to be very expensive because you're not allowed to fail. Right. And for all of the other new, new space companies, all of them, SpaceX, Blue Origin, um, Masten Space Systems, Virgin Orbital, I'm missing a bunch, Rocket Lab, like, just keep going, just keep going, right? Failure is an option. Yeah. Don't fail at your primary mission. No, no, no. But like, fail on the ground, fail early, fail often. Yeah. Figure it out. Figure it out, fix it, move fix on. Fix it and move on. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that is not how NASA works. And that same culture exists at Boeing, in my opinion. Not I like I know that culture exists at NASA. I do not know for sure it exists at Boeing, but mm -hmm. it may. It feels the same. Sure. You know? You know? <clears throat> So now we're pivoting to space launch system. I'm wondering if at this point, if the space launch system will ever be used for human spaceflight, do the growing launch options in the coming years? Uh, yeah, Awesome Astronaut makes a really good point on that one. Uh, if you take too long to do the thing, and then other people do the thing before you, then are you still the one who's gonna do the thing? I mean, it's, it's a really good point. By the time space launch system comes online, mm -hmm. uh, and, and not even just in America, though, right? 
Yeah. Like, China is definitely getting up there. Like, they want to build their own space station, which more power to them. They want to, you know, fly humans either to their space station and or to the moon and or beyond. And they're probably going to do it, right? So, and India's been working on a human spaceflight program. Like, there's a lot of other places that have been working on human spaceflight programs uh, with their own stuff for a really long time. I think this is specific to the super heavy lift class of vehicles. Sure. And I can, on one hand, count and have extra fingers count <laughs> the number of launchers. Actually, I think China does have one, and I don't remember what it is. Yeah, I think China um, does. But other than that, you're looking at ultimately at uh, super heavy with Starship. Mm -hmm. uh, is the integrated stack still called Starship? I don't Actually, even I don't know. know how that works. Honestly. I should know how that works. I, don't, I think it's still just called Starship. Um, you've got New Glenn mm -hmm. slash New Armstrong. I guess mm -hmm. I should count that as two separate rockets, but ultimately New Glenn. Because they're going to different places. Followed by New Armstrong. Yeah. Um, you've got Space Launch System. Mm hmm Right? Right. But you do still have options, so the question is... A lot of options. Will New Glenn and will Starship fly before Space Launch System is actually ready? I don't know the answer to that. Well, it, <laughs> it almost... It almost doesn't matter if it's before it's ready. Like, if... I feel like if you both reach the finish line at approximately the same time... You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, I guess, but this is over a billion per flight. It is not reusable at all. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm saying. and New Glenn are both reusable rockets. No, that's precisely what I'm saying. What the so, what, guys? So what? as a customer, if you're looking at both of those options and they're done at basically the same time. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, it almost doesn't matter if they're done yeah, at that time. The customer is NASA and this is their rocket. So if you're a customer and you've got your own rocket or someone else's rocket. Well, NASA's rocket not the only need? customer out that's there. Fair. That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, Va Vax Headroom has an interesting point. The, the space launch system should... No, I didn't intend for this to be a topic. This is how live shows go, by the way. Yeah. Space launch system should never have been a human-rated rocket. It should have been cargo only like the Ares 5 was going to be. It would have been flying already. And for those who don't know, the space launch system is derived from the Ares 5, which was part of the Constellation program. Oh, man. What a series of mistakes. It's like... Looking at Space Launch System, it was a series of mistakes after mistake after mistake to get where we're at right now. Yep. And, I mean, having a super heavy lift rocket is a good idea. We, should, we need to have redundant pathways to that. Mm. But, mm -hmm. like, man, I'm, I'm just... Uh, Peter Quinn does mention it's not a race. No, Peter it's Quinn's not. Not, not wrong. <laughs> it's not. It's not. No, matter, no matter what Time Magazine says, by the way. It's not a race. Also, Loopy brings up a good point. The price tag for the space launch system doesn't matter because the way NASA works, space launch system isn't for the market. It's for the it's the side product of NASA's main goals. And NASA's main goals are to get humans back on the moon. Mm -hmm. Right? They want to establish a permanent that's their current goals. Right. I think fundamentally this is part of the issue. Again, this goes back down to not a, this is not an engineering issue, right? It's I SLS is the perfect perfect Example of not an engineering issue. Sure. This is a management problem, and, and in many cases, a congressional issue, which we're just going to roll into management because most companies don't have Congress to deal with. This is true. Like mandating crazy, silly things that don't make sense and forcing the engineers to make certain decisions that they have no control over. Mm -hmm. The space launch system, well, at, at, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure the space launch system, at least the Ares 5, space launch system had a, con a congressional mandate to use solid rocket boosters. Yep. Required by law yep. to use solid rocket boosters on your rocket. How crazy is that? That yeah. you don't let the engineers decide that. Fundamentally, those are some of the flaws that I don't, I'm not a huge fan of uh, in Space Launch System. <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. Um, which one? Fabiano. I feel that Space Launch System is now like a poker table. The stacks are so high and it's harder to leave that table. You know, you could be right. Could be right. Absolutely. Yep. Somehow we got from Boeing to Space Launch System. <laughs> I feel like they are in the same bucket, though. Aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Tim, funny. Tim's uh, Dada basically said, "Can you imagine what the delay would have been had the Space Launch System needed to be re <laughs> recovered or reusable? First launched in 2053, while well, they figure out the whole recovery thing and that others have nailed already. Uh, you know, maybe. Here's the thing." NASA does have reusability. Well, they have refurbishability down, right? NASA had the space shuttle. I'm not a huge fan of the space shuttle. Sorry. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the space shuttle. Mm -hmm. um, they had the solid rocket motors that they did recover and reuse. They didn't, they, 
what NASA never got down wasn't the recovery part of it. They didn't get down the pricing part of it hmm. because they don't. They never needed to worry about that, right? Sure. They, to someone else's previous comment, NASA doesn't build these things to put into the market to try to sell. Right. NASA builds these things for NASA, so they don't really care if it costs more money. They'll just add it into their yearly budget, right? Sure. It's tax dollars. Right. But um, they did actually figure out refurbishability, reusing stuff, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, they, what they didn't get down to was rapidly refurbishable, mm -hmm. uh, and they didn't get down to lower cost access to space, which was the fundamental goal of shuttle. So shuttle fundamentally, as a system architecture, failed in its primary goal of reducing the cost of access to space. Yeah. It actually yeah. increased the cost of access to space. Yep. But they did have the ability to bring this stuff back, and I think they could use a lot of those lessons learned in a reusable space launch system. Although you're not wrong, I think it would have been 2053. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of funny. Um, Smokescale says, uh, on a different topic, I'd like to hear more about Astra. I haven't been able to keep track of what's been going on there. I think that's really a great topic for our space news. I think we're kind of uh, winding down a little bit mm -hmm. for this particular uh, live news show. Mm -hmm. Um, I think this was a lot of fun. I'm, so, I'm sorry that it was so long for us to get back to doing live stuff with you guys again. Uh, hopefully everyone enjoyed their time with us today. Um, <sighs> so, housekeeping notes on the show. Um, I know that it's difficult when we don't have a set time and date for the show. Totally. Understand, heard, and agreed. Mm -hmm. However, We've got crazy schedules at SpaceX right now. They're just, they're just crazy. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how to make this so that you, could, you know when and where to tune in, but we're just not there yet, and I need some more time to figure this out. Uh, I know it sucks, and I'm really sorry. The best thing I can say right now is I'm, I'm tweeting it on Twitter, mm -hmm. I'm putting it on Discord with an at here mm -hmm. tag, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to publish a show as soon as I know on YouTube, so if you've got the notification bell, you should get a notification as soon as we go live. Yep. And then once we do go live, we're giving people like 30 minutes or so to kind of like get yeah. that notification yeah, yeah, yeah. and show up. So you're, we're actually going live as we're still setting up. So you'll see like an empty set and everything else. <laughs> we're doing what we can to make this as easy on you as possible, full well understanding it needs to be fixed and it needs to change. Mm -hmm. I hear you, I understand, it's in work, I just don't have a solution yet. Uh, the second housekeeping note I wanted to make was, uh, we've been doing Ask Me Anythings uh, with me. The goal is to get those going with as many people as possible, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to have AMAs with you. I'd love to have it with Jared mm -hmm. and Jade, um, Lisa, I, everyone. Everyone associated with the show, I think, should be able to sit down and just have, and these AMAs go on for hours. They go on for however long the host is able to sit there and however long you guys have uh, compelling um, content. Uh, weight is worth the quality of the show. Well, thank you. Uh, I, ho I, ho I hope you guys enjoy the slightly updated format of the live show. Um, also, so, the AMAs. Um, I've been doing the last few AMAs. I'll probably do one or two more. Part of the AMAs, because I'm undergoing a gender transition, like half to two-thirds of the AMA have been focused on gender transition. Mm -hmm. And that is, what not, that is not what tomorrow is about. Um, that was very Canadian of me. Well, it's not that it's not what tomorrow is about, but it's not uh, going towards what tomorrow started as, uh, ironically. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. <laughs> tomorrow is about getting you interested in space and the cosmos and transition while still very interesting and having a lot to do with uh, Ben's transition to Jamie uh, does have something to do with tomorrow. It doesn't have anything to do with tomorrow, if that makes any sense. It's my personal tomorrow, and not our collective tomorrow. <laughs> yes. So, here's the deal. Um, I'm going to, I'm not going to put a hard ban on Transition Talk. Obviously, we're doing it right now at the end of the show. Um, but what I am going to say is I'm going to move all of that to its own channel. And I'm calling that channel Jamie Bits, Jamie's Bits. Jamie's me, Bits, B-I-T-S, just in case you're wondering, it makes her laugh every single time every she does time. it. I think it's hilarious. Yes, it was my name. Thank you. I know I'm funny. Um, In any case, but the thing is that all of those are going to be cut out. Uh, so, not that they won't happen necessarily, because obviously, you guys are going to ask questions and we're going to answer them. That that's why we are doing these things. But it's all going to be posted. That part of it is going to be posted on Jamie's Jamie's bits. I can't even say it. It's hard. Um, yeah. Yeah. So all of that goes over there. So the AMAs for tomorrow will be focused on space and not about me in my personal transition. I will have AM, my own personal AMAs on my own other channel. 
So if you are interested in transition, go subscribe to that channel instead. I will put a link in the description below. If you are not interested in transition, good news totally for fine. you. <laughs> totally fine. It's getting removed from this channel. So you yes. don't have to deal with that anymore. Because again, I just don't feel like it belongs here. Yeah. So um, I don't want to harp on that too much. All I want to say is I know a lot of you are interested. I will still be transparent. I will still do all that stuff, but I'm going to do it all over there. So go over there for that. This stays focused on space. And if that's you like, I will do an AMA over there as well. Oh, that's a great idea. But you need to do an AMA here. I know. Yeah, so we're going to continue to do AMAs here. Um, I might do the next one. Maybe we should do you for the next one. That might be fun. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, all right, that's it for this uh, for, <laughs> for this month. Um, I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. I'd also like to thank everyone who helps uh, contribute to the show. These mm -hmm. are the citizens of tomorrow. These are our YouTube members. These are people who contribute uh, anywhere between $50 per month and $1 per month. And I love that on YouTube you can actually get all the way down to $1 yes, per month. Yes, which is awesome. It's absolutely awesome and, and incredible. And, you know, just using advertising on the show hasn't really been something that we've been able to use to fund it. Mm -hmm. And so your memberships absolutely help a great deal. Absolutely. Uh, so if you'd like to figure out how you can help uh, crowdfund and contribute to the shows of tomorrow, head on over to youtube.com slash tmro slash join. And even at one dollar, like one dollar, that's like one soda. Uh, it's like one coffee. I, right? I don't know what you can get for a dollar anymore, honestly. If we had every single person. But you can get us for tomorrow, for a dollar. You can get us We're for We're cheap like that. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> or, or whatever whatever uh, dollar value you, you think it is worth for you. Uh, one final note, uh, we are going to try sometime in the very near future rolling in a, an advertisement from a third party. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to have a quick little thing. We're just trying it out. It's not like a permanent thing. I just want to see, because, um, you know, we are trying to keep the show funded because it takes money to keep the lights, keeps the station on orbit, right? Quite. So, um, we're going to try that out. I love, your, I love your constructive feedback on that. Um, let me know what you actually think. The first group or the first advertiser uh, we're looking at is NordVPN, v NordVPN, uh, and they've got uh, kind of a little special deal, like you get 70% off of a one-year membership, um, and then a, it's VPN service, so you actually do a bunch of really cool stuff. So still kind of contemplating all of that, but yeah. Uh, I'll buy that for, hang on, I gotta push that to the screen. Boop, <laughs> I'll buy that for a dollar. <laughs> Anyhow, yes. um, yeah, yeah, all right. I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching, and we will see you in about a month.